I'm Caitlin Kraft Buckman. I'm a founder of Women at the Table. I'm one of the leaders of the A-plus Alliance and the founders. And, and I've been asked here just to sort of give a little bit of context about why we're doing this webinar, but also what we're doing at the A-plus Alliance, which is focused on feminist AI, as is the Feminist AI Research Network, FAIR. Um, and the idea of FAIR is to work in a multidisciplinary way with um, data scientists and machine learning specialists, but also anthropologists and social workers and economists and urban planners and activists of all shapes and stripes who are feminists um, to look at artificial intelligence and also automated decision-making systems, also known as ADM, to look at them to deliver equality outcomes. The idea is that it's pro-social AI. It's not police, um, pizza delivery apps, and it's not um, car harnessing, but it's really looking at how do we use new technology to make sure that everyone is included at the beginning of the design process? How do we create new opportunities with it? And how do we actually use the technology to correct inequities as opposed to just work on mitigating the bias. So that's feminist AI. Um, and we're just hoping that we'll be able to bring social programs and policies into the 21st centuries. So Ingrid Brodvig, who's gonna be, be shepherding you through this um, webinar, um, when she came on to our team, um, she's a digital anthropologist, and we thought, my goodness, we need, we've learned so much and thought so much about anthropology and its place in the work that we're doing now. So we thought that we would um, ask her to, to uh, curate a webinar that would ask the questions that we ask ourselves sort of every day. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I'm gonna stop sharing um, the screen um, or I'll let you just uh, see who are, are the wonderful people who are going to be joining you today to speak and hand it over to Ingrid to make the introduction. So thank you very much. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you so much. And um, many thanks to the A-plus Alliance and the Feminist AI Research Network for um, bringing such critical conversations and galvanizing um, anthropologists, feminist movements, machine learning experts, AI creators and developers to come together to really develop um, common goals and visions for the future of feminist AI from an anthropological perspective. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, my name is Ingrid, I'm calling in from Cape Town and I'm really honored to be joined by a wonderful panel um, of amazing panelists, speakers from around the world. Um, so without further ado, um, welcome to um, Peace Oliver Amuge, who is the Executive Director of the Women of Uganda Network. Um, she's also a communication specialist and a gender and digital rights activist. And WUGNET has worked um, since, I think it's around 2000, the year 2000, to promote and support the use of technology by women and women's organizations in Uganda to effectively address national and local problems for sustainable development um, across sectors. So welcome, peace. We also have Sarita Amrute, who is an affiliate associate professor at the University of Washington and principal researcher at the Data and Society Research Institute. And it's a real honor, Sarita, to have you uh, with us today. Sarita is anthrop an anthropologist and a renowned scholar of race, labor, caste, and technology. And Sarita is currently conducting research on technology activism in the Indian diaspora. And she's especially interested in, and I quote, how sensation and critique yield new models and democratic practice beyond current social media hegemonies. So welcome. Uh, we also have Amina Suleimani, who's joining us from Morocco. Uh, Amina is a doctoral fellow at the Institute for Humanities in Africa and a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of Cape Town. Amina researches the intersection of cancer research, the ethics of care, artificial intelligence, and the future of hospitals in the context of Morocco with really important learnings for around the world. 
And we have Kimli Camacho joining from Costa Rica. Kimli is the co-founder and general coordinator of Sulabatsu Cooperative, a self-managed associative enterprise that works on digital technologies for local development. Kimli is a computer engineer and an anthropologist. Uh, for the last 20 years, she's been combining these fields to work on the impact and social appropriation of technologies for local development. And in recent years, Kemli has also been dedicated to promoting and strengthening the participation of women and women's leadership in the digital sector in Central America. So welcome, welcome all. Um, and welcome to our uh, audience and participants who are joining. Feel free to pop in the chat. Um, to introduce yourself and, um, and, and start to fire off any burning questions. Um, and also keen for the participants um, you know, to pop in. What does anthropology have to do with feminist AI from your perspective? Um, so without further ado, let's uh, get this conversation going. Um, so I wanna start off with a, a question and um, I think I'll come to you Sarita and, and then we'll go around the table, so to speak. Um, so really, we really want to get at the why. Why is this current moment in the history of tools uh, and particularly AI technology? Um, why is this moment so important for women's rights, for feminist movements around the world, and also for anthropologists whose mission um, and work aims to, and I quote, make the world a safer place for human difference, um, to quote Ruth Benedict. So over to you, Sarita. Thank you so much. I just wanted to thank you, Ingrid, for the invitation and Caitlin as well. Um, first, I, I want to say I'm very happy to be at this table with such an amazing group of women thinking about this problem from so many perspectives. And to begin the conversation, I'd also like to note and acknowledge that I am currently speaking to you from New York, from the traditional homelands of Lenape people. And I want to honor the contributions that the Lenape formerly enslaved people and immigrants have made to New York City um, and, and honor those legacies in our conversation today. Um, and I think that's a really nice segue to your question, Ingrid, because, you know, um, as we were talking before, anthropologists have a long history of looking at tools. Uh, some of those histories have been extremely colonial, but we are in a moment now where we can really bring feminist thinking on what the future should look like, especially thinking from um, the majority world, right? what's sometimes called the global south, how we can bring that feminist thought to bear on this really is a new collection of data centric tools. So when I understand uh, what my contribution is as a feminist anthropologist, I think it's really about three big things. The first thing is questioning. What do we mean when we say artificial intelligence? Um, recently, a writer named Emily Tucker has made the decision to not use the terms artificial intelligence or machine learning anymore in her writing because it's obfuscating. The idea that machines could possess an intelligence against which humans, especially minoritized populations are measured has a very long history. And I think as feminists and as feminist anthropologists, part of what we can do is really question that idea of intelligence. We can question, we can look behind the curtain and say, uh, what, what a certain company or a government is saying is a problem that's going to be solved through AI. What, what is that really? Is this um, advanced statistics? Is this a promise of pattern matching that we do not know whether or not can be fulfilled. And that allows us to ask then what is a bunch of secondary but very important questions about the political economy of the development of these new tools. So where are the populations that are being used as experimental subjects to see if these technologies will work? That's one political econ economic question. How are these tools and technologies distributed differently throughout the world with different, different effects? And especially for those of us thinking and speaking from the majority world, I think that's a really important question to ask because in fact, sometimes what we see and good examples of this would be social media algorithms. 
the, the product is actually different depending on where you're located. So we could say that for many places in the world, and I, I'm specifically talking here now, my, what I research, which is South Asia, Facebook in South Asia is not the same as, as the Facebook I'm experiencing here in, in New York. We could even think of that version of Facebook as a kind of junk technology, because in fact, it's not very well supported. And so the kind of abuse that can happen on those platforms uh, where they don't have enough language experts, for instance, to really understand what's going on is big. So the second big potential here, I think, for feminism and feminist anthropology is to really think about, think about those geopolitical differences. How does something that seems universalizing actually end up looking very different and have very different instantiations in different parts of the world. And then I'll mention one more big area and then I'm gonna stop because I don't wanna monopolize the conversation. The third area for me is in this imagining different futures, not only imagining, but also building them together in coalition. And that's one reason that I think this table here is so important because Ingrid, you've done such a good job of bringing people together who sit in different parts of the world with different expertise and also different kinds of practice. Um, and so what I think that uh, anthropology, feminist anthropology can really offer here is a subverting or turning upside down the deficit narrative. The deficit narrative says that women in the majority world, for instance, are, are on the receiving end of harm. And that's the end of the story. Yes, it's true, women are on the receiving end of harms from automated technologies, but it's also true that minoritized populations are innovating all the time and creating solutions. And so I think the third big thing that we can do is uplift those solutions um, and, and argue with a really strong voice, not only should these communities have a seat at the table, but they should be listened to, right? they should be leading these new developments that we want to see in the world. Thank you, Sarita. Thank you for raising those really important points. Um, and welcome anyone else to jump in. I go, Ingrid, if you want. Yes. And yes. I, I totally agree with what Samita just said. Uh, Sarita just said, really. Really, I, I sign uh, her intervention. Uh, and maybe what I would like to add uh, from our perspectives in the COP and, and in the COP, we are, we are many anthropologists. We are uh, a women anthropologists and we discuss a lot around, around that. And for us, something very crucial is to understand algorithms as a cultural artifact. Yes, a cultural artifact that uh, express power relationship concentrated in less people than never, uh, a depredator economic model, um, and, uh, and, uh, in, in a, and, and the destruction of the environment. Then, then if we see algorithms as a cultural artifact, you need, we need to analyze the algorithm as a tool to answer the, the culture where we are living. If we don't understand algorithms as a cultural artifact and we think it's te a technical issue, we are separating human rights from the technology. And if, the, if we see algorithms just as a technical informatic engineering problem, we promote a colonialist technology. We more complicated are the algorithms and their logic, I, more difficult for people in the communities to understand them and to understand the relationship between them and their daily life. Uh, we at Sulawatsu work in what we call the popular education for the digital society. We retake popular education from the 15, uh, 16, 70s, and we are uh, working with popular education, but now to understand and to 
um, appropriate the digital uh, society to bring population closer to algorithms, artificial intelligence, and to understanding how the digital economy works and uh, how they work based in extractivism of everything, their data, their knowledge, their, their natural resources. We believe that this is the moment, at uh, this moment of development of the digital society, we need to rethink human rights. Uh, and, and I'm going to raise this point in the next question. But in, in summary, for us, it's very important to develop popular education for the, for the digital society, for the people to understand how the society is working and how the tools are working, because tools are totally disconnected from people because the origin of these tools is uh, just uh, accumulation, yes? Thanks, Kevly. Thanks also. I really appreciate what you um, said about the algorithms as cultural artifact and how these are becoming our ingrained um, uh, social archive and linking back to then creating new possibilities and imagining what the future could look like in a way that's more flexible and adaptable and nuanced and that really reflects the the realities that people change and societies change over time. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, over to uh, Peace, do you wanna come in? Yes, I would like to come in. Thank you, Ingrid, and thank you uh, everyone else who is joining this uh, conversation. I want to come in from where uh, Kimli uh, uh, touched as well around uh, understanding or creating awareness. I think that is something that is really lacking when we talk about AI, when we talk about uh, feminists coming in big number and seeing them embrace the use of AI. I think there's really a big issue of, uh, of understanding it. And not only the feminists, not only the users, uh, also we need to look at like the policy makers. Uh, policies are very important when we want to change something, uh, but you realize that not only us, uh, the feminists, the women, the structurally silenced uh, populations uh, do not uh, understand this thing, but also the, the, the uh, uh, the, 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 po policy, the policy makers. And then what I want to add on is that um, when we talk about the use of AI to embrace it, we cannot really see further if we cannot have girls, young girls, take uh, be part of it. We need to have the young people, the young girls embrace the youth, the young girls being part of the developers because they would uh, do something that definitely would work for them. So I think it's really important to talk about it. And I think something that has made it incredibly important is the pandemic. The pandemic has shown us that we cannot stay offline. Everybody has to come online. Look at Uganda now. Previously, we would fill uh, hard copies of forms to apply for a passport. That is totally not being used at all. Everyone has to go online, apply online, do everything online. Imagine how tough it is for someone who has not been uh, on this digital platform, who has not been uh, doing anything online. So it's incredibly, incredibly important for us to understand dynamics online, especially with the use of AI that we cannot run away from. So yeah, I thought I should add that, thank you. Wonderful, thanks, Peace. And, and thanks also for bringing in the, the future generation and the, the critical role of girls in, in shaping such systems and tools and futures. Um, over to you, Amina, your, your thoughts on why this moment is so critical for, for women's rights and gender justice. Thank you so much, Ingrid. And I join um, the speakers here to thank you for organizing this and for making it intergenerational. I think it's quite important to have not only many people coming from different spaces, but also different ages with different experiences. Um, I think on my end, definitely for the longest, the role of the anthropologist has been limited to thinking, I'd say limited, I mean, definitely thinking about tools, but within spaces that are uh, 
noted as tribal or in this like in the context of Morocco, we know that anthropology or anthropological research has been bound to researching about Islam or women's oppression uh, or um, political economy. And I think now we're pushing the boundary and we're saying we want to be part of uh, tech not the, the, the tech world and actually understanding AI as a materiality, but also as an abstract cloud that is very opaque. Um, and I think we're, also at a moment where the discipline is critically renewing itself, uh, while we're trying to acknowledge the colonial legacy, uh, of course. But I think I personally, for instance, look, I think it's important because when we look up people, for instance, the algorithmic Justice League in the US, um, they've started because of uh, a racial bias and started a movement that tried to recenter people's dignity in the development of AI technologies. Um, and I think it's also important to be considering AI and researching about AI, but I, because I think we're at a we're at a critical turn that is coming back more visibly, which is bio warfare. Um, I don't want to take this line of thought, but just really thinking about how um, it's really interesting to think that as critical and decolonial feminists, we need to be thinking um, about AI because we are still anti-war and that in some places um, AI is used for bio-warfares and it is, I mean, women remain the primary um, victims of war. Um, so I think for me, those are critical aspects on why to think about AI today. Mm, thank you for raising that, um, Amina. And um, yeah, also the importance of bringing together conviviality of different movements, perspectives, but um, in this urgent time of, as, as you say, um, where these technologies are, are potentially and are weaponized or used to ingrain systemic bias and discrimination um, by, by design and by fact of who's creating them. Um, so I want to I want to go to our next question, which is really to um, dig more in, into your work and learn more about your work specifically um, around the table. Um, so what does your work and research um, as an anthropologist, as a women's right, rights activist, or at the intersection of both, um, what does your work teach us about really the significance of AI algorithms um, and technology um, for women's rights in this time. And it would be great to learn um, examples and, and stories and cases of, of what you're um, exploring currently too. Um, Sarita, over, over to you. Um, great, thank, thank you. Uh, I, I just, before I, I launch into that, I just wanted to say, um, I really appreciated that that last round. I mean, this, this question of policymakers and what, what they know and they don't know, and then the uses of algorithmic systems in, um, in states of war, and also the need for public education. I think those are so really, really important points. I just wanted to say, I appreciate um, the speakers highlighting those. So uh, my trajectory, my, my first set of, of work really looked at labor, um, the way that algorithmic systems, um, as Kemi was saying, it can seem as if they're functioning without humans. But in fact, as, as we say, there are humans in the loops at every juncture. So in my first set of, of work, in my first book, I tried to show how those humans, and I was looking at uh, transnational coders from India working all over the world, are doing a lot of kind of the back end work of producing the systems, but at the same time, um, we're not recognized as such. So one of the big findings of my work is that um, in each place where we might see an algorithmic system being deployed, there are people who are doing the labor, not only of innovating it, but maintaining those systems, especially making those systems work in contexts for which they aren't, haven't been designed. And that, that labor for me is extremely important to recognize both 
um, in terms of the way that those workers produce a lot of value in these systems, but aren't compensated properly. That's one big piece. And second, as a real source of knowledge about how these systems are actually functioning as opposed to what the promise of the system is. So if you want to think about what legislators need to know, um, one thing that they, they need to know is uh, do the AI systems, do the algorithmic systems that they are, they are either purchasing through government procurement or uh, okaying or legislating about, are they working as promised? And if not, uh, what's going wrong, right? So that, so that I think is a big finding in my work. There are the, some of the experts, uh, even though they're never called experts, are those who are making the systems function on the ground. So that could be content moderators, or that could be a local level worker who is collecting the data to fill in an online form. They will know so much about how that form doesn't meet the needs of actually existing women, for instance, and that knowledge needs to be elevated. Um, another big finding of my, my current set of research, which is about how dissenters communicate online with each other, um, is that there are systemic problems that are unfortunately st still being dealt with on a piecemeal fashion. So uh, in my context in particular, a lot of what I am seeing is um, trans people, Muslims, and Dalit Bahujan people in, in particular face tremendous amounts of uh, online harassment and also offline violence. Uh, but because those incidences are treated, in my case, by social me media companies in a piecemeal fashion, the systemic problems that are producing these effects aren't really being addressed. And so that's another uh, big finding of my work. And it leads to something that I think is important to stress, particularly for feminists. Um, I think a, a lot of the times, um, as Peace was saying, algor algorithmic systems seem very experience far, but it, as a matter of fact, they are operating within and alongside already existing institutions. So if we already have a critique, let's say, of, um, of caste-based violence in South Asia, uh, then it only makes sense as as feminists to extend that critique to how algorithmic systems are um, enabling that violence, or on the other hand, um, how, how um, Dalit or Bahujan activists can use the, these online systems or these communication systems to raise their voices and make the larger society aware of the problems that they're facing. Awesome, thank you, Sarita. Um, anyone else, Kemli, would you like to come in about um, what your your work um, tells us and the about the significance of this moment and AI and I AI tools in the communities you work with? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a really, really interesting and beautiful panel. I feel really honored to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Ingrid, for inviting me and Caitlin. Um, um, let's see, since uh, 2013, we have been working with indigenous, rural, coastal, black, and urban, urban women in, in the process, in this process of uh, popular education of the digital society and in community creation of digital tools for their own context, yes? And based in this experience of creating digital tools for each context, for each community, uh, we have developed a, a group of principles. And I would like to share with you three of them. We consider these principles at this moment as uh, the new human rights for the digital society with a feminist perspective. 
uh, the first uh, principle or the first human right, uh, we, we call the right to data. And in this case, is not only the right to understand what data, uh, what happened with the data I share, uh, what the application do with my data, where they come, or how this data contribute to strengthening an economical model. Uh, but um, that means the right to data means the possibility for communities and population to develop their own data, the data that we want, the data that we need. And for that is urgent to develop capacities in the local context about how to develop my own data. What data I do want to have to understand my context, to act in my context, to develop my own tools, et cetera. In this sense, we have uh, been working in methodologies about how to develop this data at the community level. Uh, at this moment, for instance, we are working with women in the IT sector about what data do women need uh, for women working in the IT sector, what data do they need to understand their own reality as worker as the IT industry, for instance. And it's very interesting because if we approach communities and people in this sense, we discover a lot of data that are not raised at this moment and because they have never taken in count what community and population needs. The second right that we call the right to the algorithm, and this is very crucial for us because um, is related with the need to develop participatory processes to create algorithms, yes? Uh, algorithm, we have to, to we have to approach the, the algorithms as a cultural artifact, as I said before, and we have to develop participatory processes to create algorithms to define which decisions algorithms are going to make, how they are going to decide that which patterns they, they are going to use for the in artificial intelligence, how they are going to clean the data, all of that which is looked or understanding as um, technical problems have to be uh, community problems or community decisions. Then more and more, for especially with the public algorithms uh, for health, for education, for uh, political participation, we are working in this process of developing uh, participatory algorithms and create this methodology about how to develop algorithms in, in a participatory way. And the last right I want to raise, uh, just because of the time, is the right to develop your own tools, your own digital tools, or your own digital applications. And this is a process we have been working since uh, 2013 with girls, in especially young women in communities, yes, about what tools they need for their own context for the community, for the neighborhood, for the territory. Um, in this sense, for instance, we have been working since, uh, since 2018 with indigenous communities about what tools they need for their own context, while, what digital tools they, they need. And we think it's a right for the communities to develop their own tools to define and to design the, their tools. And there, uh, again, we have uh, developed this methodology about how to design my own tool. The technical development, the code, and all of that is a technical issue, but the design of the tool have to be uh, in the hands of the women in the communities. 
then those are the three aspects I would, would, would like to raise in this discussion about the new rights, as we call, in this digital society for an, an inclusive uh, artific artificial intelligence, especially uh, with women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kemli, for raising those really important points. And um, in the next question, we'll come around more to reflect on the tools specifically and the context of how they're actually shaping um, social, economic, and political community systems. Um, but first, over to Peace um, to share more about, about your work in, in this space and um, what your work is, is teaching us about um, really the significance of, of AI technology for women in the communities you work with. Thank you, thank you, Ingrid. And uh, uh, my thought, I'm going to really share my thoughts not very far away from the issue of data because it's really important when we talk about having women participate in algorithm, it's really important that they have access, they have, uh, they can use uh, data. So WOOCnet has been doing some work, uh, research on data justice. And we looked at the pillars of data justice of equity, access, identity, knowledge, power, and participation. And I want to just quickly uh, take you through some of the, the things that I found, uh, that we found out that uh, I thought is very important uh, to bring in this conversation. Uh, we worked with three groups, we worked with developers who are really important when we talk about uh, algorithm, and then we worked with policy makers, and then we also worked with the impacted communities, which had women, uh, persons with disability, it had the LBKI community, it had really a group of uh, a mixed uh, people, people who live in rural areas, and uh, something, for instance, in our conversations with the developers, uh, we realized that they are not, they don't find it important because we, were, we wanted to know from them if they think it is important to involve, let's say, women, if you're uh, developing something that you will, you know that they will use it, they need to use it, both men and women, you know, uh, and they did not see the point, they actually, uh, because one, most of them are profit making. So they are they're excited about a solution that they've found and they are not thinking about the end users. They are not thinking about the different gender dynamics, the inclusivity need. They're not thinking about persons with disability. And so then uh, they don't see the importance of, of involving these people. They also don't see the importance of working with the policy makers. That is not their concern. Their concern is developing the, uh, the, the, the tool and, and pushing it out and they are happy they've achieved. And then something also with the policy makers, uh, you realize that they don't also involve uh, much uh, with the developers. They should be able to, to involve the developers. They are doing a lot of regulations. They are heavily regulating the online spaces, but, uh, the developers are really important in this conversation. So, and then something that also we found in the group of the policy makers was that they are very much ignorant about the day-to-day -day life and the day-to-day -day usage access of these tools. Uh, and yet they are our policy makers that we are putting all our lives on, we're putting our hopes on them that, oh, we need policies, we need policies that are gender responsive, we need policies uh, that are inclusive, but, they don't understand these things. Uh, the policymakers don't understand these things. So we will, you know, like they would bluntly say, oh, I don't understand these terms. Could you please explain. And we would get disappointed uh, for, for real, but it's a fact because the policymakers are members of parliament, you know, who come from different fields. Some of them don't totally understand these things. So that was something that we found out in this uh, research that we were doing. And then when it came to the impacted community, it was really absurd to realize that uh, they know that yes, it is my data, but they have no control of their data. They have no, there's nothing they can do about it. And also something that keeps pushing forward, something that's very historical, the cultures, the biases, uh, uh, the inequalities, you know, that exist uh, from our patriarchal society from, from back then still keeps coming on and keeps going ahead of us. 
in everything that we talk about. And it's ahead of us when we talk about algorithm. So then these communities uh, feel like they have no control. They have nothing to do, you know. They don't understand, they don't have the good understanding when we talk about uh, data justice, when we talk about them having the power and they should participate, they should be able to, 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 to give their thoughts the, to, to the developers. They're like, okay, should we be asked? But we are never asked, how can we do it? So uh, I thought I should share with you some of these uh, uh, things that are coming up in, in, this, in this research. Thank you, Ingrid. Thanks, Peace, for raising those really important um, issues also of transparency, accountability, and the shaping of um, democratic public spheres and um, the role of policy. Um, Amina, over to you, um, if you could share also more about your work and your, your, what you're finding um, in your work. Thank you, Ingrid. I'm actually very, um, sorry, the slim. I'm happy to pick up uh, after a piece because of the so many intersections and similarities that I that I thought about while, while listening to her, because opacity is so interesting to think about along uh, with AI and the actually different fabrics of the opacity um, that, that surrounds it. So I'm definitely, new on the field as an ethnographer, just started uh, doing my PhD field work. Um, so I tried to research the intersections uh, between AI, cancer research and diagnosis, and the circulation of genomics data when it gets um, circulated across the places from which the algorithm was made to the place it's being deployed. Um, and definitely thinking along that a lot of people think positively about it because it comes to respond to a population's need, which is bod bodily healing with, you know, the diagnosis that shall perhaps provide primary step towards uh, well-being. And also from what I understand so far is that the public health ecosystem is definitely very far from realizing the national development policies, which politicians are speaking about. We want to digitize health and so on. But I just want to share an anecdote that I've seen on the ground uh, or on the field that really made me understand that the AI can um, rep reproduce uh, sort of the existing socioeconomic inequalities um, in, in terms of accessing technologies uh, in Morocco's context. So, um, in one of my visits to one of the associations for cancer children, I got to attend a workshop where their parents came and there was a primary oncologist who was there to respond to the parents' questions. And they all came carrying notebooks. So I thought, so at first I had this uh, very premature thought of, oh, okay, they're going to take notes and so on. Um, but these were people who were coming from uh, the villages, uh, very rural villages um, in, from many different parts of, Mor of Morocco. And those notebooks served rather as a communicative tool between uh, various health workers, between, the, between oncologists and uh, lab, laboratory tests. And it was, it, it was really interesting for me to read, for instance, Morocco's development plan with bringing AI and big data into oncology research, but also having patients carry notebooks that they themselves couldn't decipher or couldn't read. They needed a third party, which was an oncologist, to come and sort of support them in that, um, in, in that understanding of the diagnosis. And I think that just really made me think about how feminism has convinced us that the personal is political and the right to health also becomes quite a political and civil matter that we can't uh, unthink. And so I think for me, it's been really interesting not to depoliticize who has access to AI algorithms uh, for cancer diagnosis and who doesn't. Um, and I wanted to give the example of the notebook to say that, uh, for instance, we all know that to develop an AI, we need we need data. We need to feed it to feed it a particular set of data. 
And to think that a lot of Moroccan public hospitals do not have suitable quote unquote systems to record that data or to have digital medical reports uh, means that a lot of cancer patients data or records or records will not be taken into the system. Um, and another anecdote that I also found quite interesting to think about, which ties into this notion of um, service over, um, I mean, safety over service, or basically, sorry, I mean, um, letting go of privacy in order to access a service, uh, which was related to how one of the parents mentioned that his daughter's blood test had gone to another country uh, for, uh, for it to get tested and to get a diagnosis, but that he didn't know anything about it. Um, so there was no consent taken. And the idea that AI will, well, so far there's no articulation of the word AI, there's just the system. And we don't know what this system is and it comes under different um, sort of players. Um, but basically that, we shall um, accept the diagnosis, but that the consent will not necessarily be um, shared or approved, which, which I found also quite critical to, to think about. Um, and in that process, uh, to also wonder and ask which patient's data gets silenced uh, during the development of context-specific algorithms, especially if all cancer diagnosis algorithms are going to come from elsewhere, uh, whose data are they being fed, uh, who will not get the right diagnosis and so on. Um, and I also just wanted to highlight how I think technology and AI and what I'm hearing personally is that it, it does present an imaginary of well-being and hope uh, as it stands. Uh, hope to get access to a diagnosis, to personalized medicine. However, I think we're also seeing a privatization of care, a privatiza privatization of medicine. There's so many booming oncology clinics uh, here in Morocco's context, and they have digital reports because they have the staff, they have uh, the infrastructure for it. And I think um, the questions that I'm still thinking with is, um, are we, is AI going to decide in the public health uh, sector who gets to live and who doesn't? Uh, and will governments do anything about it, if at all? Thank you, Amina, for that really critical um, perspective and intervention. It's really interesting to hear also all your reflections from the field um, and also studying an institution and institution and policy and and um, and the critical um, issues of, of data flows and what decisions are made about who um, through through which data, whose data, and critical issues of surveillance, privacy, data protection, and consent, um, which are so critical to feminist movements. Um, I want to now jump to the next question, which I think we've started to reflect on quite a lot, which is really um, kind of zooming out to the, the broader political economy or systems questions of really how these tools are shaping our social, economic and political system, changing the so-called modes of production in, in, in economic um, systems and really shaping the future of, of human life in this time and our, um, as a species actually, our interconnection with um, other ecological systems, other species, the world around us. So um, in reflecting on, on such tools, kind of zooming out of um, these broader systems, um, what is your vision of feminist AI and, and what does the future look like if, uh, if AI, um, can be developed and will be developed with um, feminist principles and ethics of care at heart. 
Um, I'll come to you, Sarita. And I, I know you have to jump off at the top of the hour. So also just thank you so, so much for being with us. And yeah, welcome your-, your um... Yeah, uh, thank you. That's a, that's a very big question. Um, and in, in a sense for me, um, the answer really comes from people on the ground and communities from the ground with whom I work. So uh, in my current practice, everyone I talk to, I, I've been asking them this question, what, where do you go to? What's your source for thinking about uh, the future that you want to see? Um, and I'm getting a lot of different answers, but, uh, but one of the things that's emerging almost universally uh, is that communities want to be listened to. So while it is absolutely true that all of the communities we're talking about, whether it's policymakers, um, patients in Morocco, or women in Costa Rica, while it's absolutely true that there's a huge knowledge gap, all of us, us included, right, um, don't really quite understand these opaque systems um, fully. Um, it's also true that communities on the ground have firsthand experience of the effects of these systems, both in terms of what they can offer and the, and the questions about whose life, as Amina was saying, whose life is being valued in which way and which life is being thought of disposable, of disposable as disposable life or a subject population that can be experimented on. Uh, so from what, what I'm getting from the people that I'm talking to, they really are asking for some really basic things um, to be able to communicate with one another to surface problems without immediately being harassed, uh, hounded, or being subject to violence. That goes right to what Kemi was saying about the question of human rights. And then to produce algorithmic systems that answer actually existing needs on the ground. So often when I see what developers of algorithmic systems, what they're doing, they're a little bit like someone who has a hammer. And so they're looking at everything as if it were a nail. Uh, and it really gets to this question of what is a tool? Um, and instead, for me, what we really need to do is completely explode our idea of what counts as a tool. And this to me is another feminist principle because in fact, knowledges produced by women, by indigenous communities are often relegated in a way to secondary derivative or um, less important knowledge. And in fact, I think we need to bring those back into the conversation completely and start with those practices um, and see what would be the natural progression from those everyday practices into something that would look like an algorithmic system. Um, so for instance, in the work that I'm doing, um, a, a lot of people have a lot of cybersecurity concerns and there are a lot of tools out there that can help you stay safe, but most of them are very impractical. They are not made for situations with low bandwidth. They're not made for situations where multiple people are using the same devices. And to Amina's point, they're not made for situations where people have various degrees of literacy and have various degrees of literacy in the English language. So that right there is one big cluster of problems. And the solutions to that, to those problems would look like multilingual efforts, um, getting away from purely technical solutions, thinking about cybersecurity from a community perspective, thinking about layered cybersecurity. So who within the group can step forward to make public statements at which time? These are not my ideas. These are the things that people I'm working with are actually innovating but they're happening on the side in the margins behind the scenes. And none of that expert knowledge is ever is really ever brought into these conversations and valued as such. So for me, you know, that that would be the feminist, that, that would be the feminist um, algorithm, one, an algorithm that looks more like a, a pot that pours water and less like a hammer, to, to speak very metaphorically. 
Thanks, Sarita. I love that. <laughs> and um, thank you so much also for joining us today. I know you've got to jump off. So um, yeah, thank you so, so much. And um, over to Kemli um, to reflect on the tools of our times and systems and your vision of feminist AI. Thank you. Maybe I'm going to raise uh, a little bit another point. And because we, as women, we are really very concerned about the close relationship between artificial intelligence and extractivism. And extractivism so of everything, extractivism of data, of local knowledge, of nature. Uh, the more we work with artificial intelligence for accumulation and profitability, we more at, at risk uh, for all the species and for our planet and even for our universe because we are consuming the space also. Um, then there, there is a direct relationship. We think that we have discussed that with women in communities, uh, a direct relationship between artificial intelligence for accumulation and the destruction of the planet. Yes, for this reason, uh, we have been working with Central America women in the construction of other economic forms of digital society. We see a, a, strong, a, strain, a strong relationship between the, the economic models and the economic, um, and the, the economic expression uh, and for to develop tools and technology and the uh, 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 impact in the, in the environment. And in this sense, we are exploring and trying to explore other economical expression, trying to develop other forms of econ economic uh, ways to do um, economy in the digital society. And uh, since uh, three years ago, we are exploring uh, with um, um, platform cooperatives, yes, uh, whose purpose is not profitability and accumulation, yes, and uh, is more associative, co collective, community, economic expression where the means of production is a digital platform owned by its own women workers. And wh what I would like to raise here is with a feminist approach, we have also uh, to develop other economic models, other ways to do economy in the digital society and demonstrate that there is possible to develop economic forms, uh, not only related with accumulation. And uh, with platform co-ops, we have explored that as a feminist approach to the digital economy to create tools for communities. Then uh, this is something that I wanted to raise also. Thanks, Kimli, and thanks for bringing up also the intersection of um, all these really critical economic justice, climate justice, justice, gender justice, and, and how they all must come together to build the tools of, of our future. Um, Peace, over to you um, on your vision of feminist AI and um, the tools of our, of our times. Thank you, Ingrid. So, um... My vision of the, uh, of the AI that we would like to see is uh, one that, that, that does not focus, focus on morals, but focus on digital human rights, where, you know, your data is protected, you know, you're safe online, you're not discriminated against your gender or, or race, you know, sexuality. And uh, the one that, uh, you know, uh, that encourages women to, to participate in the meaningful conversation and not to be left out. That's the vision that I would uh, I would like to to see in the AI in the future. The one that the young girls can be able to jump in and not think, okay, they're too young. All the all the women are left out. That does not discriminate, like I said. So yeah, I end there. Thank you. 
Thank you, Peace. Thank you, such important points. Um, Amina, over to you. Thank you so much, Ingrid. I actually thought a lot about this question. I don't think I have an answer that is applied, uh, but I just I just have some thoughts from um, my research so far and some of my previous thinking about it. And I think I'd like to think about decolonial feminist AI uh, that is rooted in plurality, so not necessarily producing a universal notion of a feminist AI. Um, but uh, definitely one that, uh, that has the fight for gender equality and justice at the center, uh, for anti-extractivism, um, as, um, as Kimmy has said. Um, and I think I, I was wondering if it's also perhaps useful to come up with sort of a, a toolbox, an ideological toolbox um, pertaining to decolonial feminist AI and how to go about research within this, um, this sphere, bringing together feminist movements and anthropologists, um, but also coders and uh, developers, people working in the business side of things, even though we want this decolonial feminist AI to be anti-capitalist. Um, and I think for me, I, I see it really as a commitment uh, to women and feminist researchers uh, who are willing to dig further to always uh, be on the table and to open the door to other women who want to understand better the opacity of AI. Um, I also see this decolonial feminist AI as one that acknowledges uh, past intellectual work that's been written, not necessarily about AI, because I think here we want to uh, contest the idea that AI is a new technology, but that it's rather, uh, it rather sits on the ruins of empire and of particular routes of extractivism. And I think it's important to think about thinkers who've, uh, who've questioned positivist science uh, and hegemonic modes of production and modes of knowing that um, the majority of algorithms that we perhaps, uh, algorithmic models that we use um, are based on. Um, and yeah, as, as Sarita left, but to think about AI as rooted in materiality, so labor, capital, um, power. Um, I think I'll end there, <laughs> not, not to yeah, take too much time. Thanks, Amina, and also thanks for situating that. Yeah, we do have um, knowledge, um, ide ideological frameworks, and um, possibilities for, um, for collectively reimagining the future of feminist AI tools, um, lessons from the past to inform the future and dwelling on the political economy, um, the materiality of, of, of these tools. And, um, and, and really, I think also imagining what the future um, could look like at the intersection of collective governance, um, accountability, intersectionality, and really um, new possibilities for not only being but becoming um, uh, that that these systems need to also accommodate um, such a changing world and and new identities and new mobilities that will inevitably um, raise new challenges but also new opportunities to develop a more collective thriving inclusive world based on 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 on, on human rights and equality um, so I just want to touch to the, the last question um, before we open up to, to questions from the audience and participants, um, which is really kind of the looking forward of the next steps of, of where can we go from here. Um, so from your perspectives, how can feminist movements, anthropologists, interdisciplinary researchers and, and other movements build alliances with um, people who are building AI tools um, and together, you know, work to create a more inclusive, um, thriving feminist future based on an ethics of care. Um, who needs to be at the table for feminist AI to uh, be developed, to develop, the, to develop new tools? 
um, but also for, for AI to move us in the right direction of um, charting a feminist future. Thank you very much, Ingrid. I think, I think anthropologists can have to play a crucial role here. And um, first, I have to say that we, we all know there are large anthropology departments dedicated to user studies, to user experience uh, in, the, in large platforms, in intelligence uh, for, for the welfare, or among other spaces. Yes, then anthropology and technology is a connected uh, field, uh, fields already, yes. But I think uh, we, we have to, to think about uh, which have to be, has to be the role of anthropologists and especially anthrop women anthropologists. Uh, and, and for us is uh, first, uh, of course, uh, this process of uh, popular education uh, has to be developed with anthropologists on the table. Yes, and communities, because it's, uh, it's really um, a cultural approach, yes, uh, to the technology, what we need there, okay? Uh, I think uh, more and more we need, um, we need the relationship between, between technical people and anthropologists. I always says that computer informatics is more social than what we think is a more a social field than what we think, yes, and how we are educated in computer engineering with no social skills and no social studies. And I think more and more we need this interdisciplinary approach to develop the tools and to develop the technology, especially for our countries in the South, yes, and for our people in the South. I think we have uh, as an, an, an anthropology, as anthropologists, as a women anthropologist, to create a critic analysis to the technology and uh, support this process in the community and question the, questioning the technology always, especially at this moment where the technology is looking at the solution for the pandemia, uh, for the pandemia challenges, yes. Uh, uh, the, the digital transformation is now the magic solution for all the problems. And we have to, 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 to develop that in our countries, the possibility to question in that from girls, from uh, women, from uh, organized, gr organized groups, et cetera. And um, I, I think uh, um, until now, women have been very uh, excluded from the development of digital tools in the world in general. I think a good relationship with, between anthropologists and um, uh, women in technology and women anthropologists together can develop other kind of tools with other principles, with, uh, with other uh, ways to understand what in, uh, artificial, artificial intelligence have to uh, be in our context. Then this is how I think uh, we have to work together. Wonderful, thanks, can we? Um, peace, your thoughts on movement building the way forward, who needs to be at the table. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you, Ingrid. I was thinking about what Kim said and I wanted to say that she already mentioned some of the uh, thoughts that I have. And so I will uh, still insist that we need to do a lot of research. We need to have the data if we need to have different stakeholders come on the table, then we need to have evidence of what we're talking about. Uh, but we shouldn't end at uh, stretching out to do research and have the data to inform our actions. We should also share the, 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 the knowledge that we have. We need to really embrace uh, the act of sharing knowledge because sometimes 
you sit with people and they talk about something and you're like, okay, you have this. We needed this so much. You see, then you realize that we have a lot of resources that are not shared. So we need to uh, do that. Then I also think that uh, we need to have the right policies in place. We need to have the right uh, legal framework in place. And sometimes, okay, not really, I think, uh, very much for the case of uh, AI, but uh, that we have a lot of policies in place. Uh, this is very much on the other, other, other sectors. Uh, sometimes also we have the right policies in place, the right uh, laws in place, but then there are gaps that comes in when we talk about the implementation, then the gaps are there. So then you realize that sometimes these policies and uh, laws are not monitored, the implementation of these policies and laws are not monitored. So we need to ensure that we have the right policies in place and laws in place, and then their implementations are, mo are monitored. So that we ensure that you know the the reviews and the rest, so that so that we can have uh, an inclusive and uh, gender responsive uh, policies in place, and then also to really talk about bringing people on the table. For instance, we are on this table. You can really feel that we bring diverse thoughts, but we still miss other people that needs to be brought on the table, like uh, the the law enforcers. We need to have the 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 marginalized women, the structurally silenced women on this table, we need to have the policymakers on this table. We need to have the judiciary on the table. Uh, yesterday I was listening into a webinar that I found uh, the panel very interesting, so I joined. And uh, this, uh, there was a, a, just, a, a, a lawyer, a, a, just, a judge who was part of this panel, and he said, uh, what can we do as a, as a court? We don't make this policy. Look at your uh, policy makers, look at the legislators, you know? So I thought it made a very good point because sometimes, but also, yes, they, they need to know, you know, when the issues come to them, when uh, the, the, there's someone brings in a, a case to them, they need to know, definitely. So they cannot uh, entirely blame the policy makers. So I think everybody just needs to join in and everybody needs to come on this table for us to see a change. Thank you. Thank you, Peace. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, and thank you for repositioning that, just the need for open opening up spaces for for decision of decision making and dialogue um, to include everyone across the spectrum from literally all walks of life. Um, Amina, over to you. Um, what what are your thoughts on on this and the way forward and movement building? Thank you so much. Well, I couldn't agree more uh, with Peace and, and Kemi. And I I definitely think for for the collaboration aspect, the more alliances, the better uh, with evidence-based research that is both qualitative and quantitative, one's personal experience as a critical um, sort of evidence to, to hold uh, and to bring into the table. Um, and, I, and I definitely see it as a much larger sort of patchwork across time and space, uh, time being that really just needing to anchor the ancestral feminist teachings um, which have been transmitted to us and the ones that we're yet to sort of look for and, and speciality because um, I, I think the struggle unites us in terms of ensuring that there is access and that there is no discrimination. Um, I think I was just thinking that a grassroots AI working group on the African continent would be a critical thing to kick off perhaps. And sometimes when we don't have the solution, I, I think it's also just as powerful to come and, and speak about what's uh, what's at stake and what is happening in different contexts. Um, and perhaps in that space, there could be sort of an agreement about how do we define an ethics of care and how do we define a feminist uh, AI ethics and how do you do research in such a space? Um, and I also thought that as a researcher within anthropology, as anthropologists coming into the table, working with feminist movements, I don't think we should come trying to defend the discipline, but rather use its tools 
um, and I mean, holistically, I don't think, I think it would be much more fruitful if any, if everyone would not necessarily be the gatekeeper of his or her or her own discipline, uh, but rather come thinking about the cause uh, that we want to solve for. Um, and I think that it's this coming together definitely to think and to co-create models uh, is important, but it, I think it's just as powerful to, to come together to give meaning to AI since we collaboratively sometimes do not understand what it means and it may mean different things in different spaces. Um, and yeah, just really thinking about the notions of transmission and um, thinking about how can we move on with the notion of AI, thinking about um, histories which, has, which have been previously silenced um, and how can we make sure that the new spaces in which AI is deployed holds uh, space for truth and for histories uh, which, which have been buried before. So it's, for me, it's very much uh, ideological, but perhaps um, can be powerful in grounding a space that can create much more powerful solutions um, and collaboration. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and um, just um, to expand on that, that um, I think it's it's also really important to um, to resituate belonging and what it means to belong in such spaces and in the technologies, tools, and systems of the future, and really creating new possibilities for being and 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 truly belonging um, and and creating new avenues for for self representation and and sovereignty in in these spaces. Um, so yeah thank you such a this has just been so illuminating and such an honor to to sit with you all and and listen um i want to open up to the to the participants if anyone has any um questions um or if if you have questions for each other um we have a few minutes left so i think we've <laughs> we've touched on quite some um you know quite a lot of grounds today but if um you have questions for each other things that you're still thinking about and of course if um participants joining us today have any questions um feel free to to pop them in the chat Um, there's actually one question here um, for Amina. Um, BT says, thank you for the intervention. Have you come across risk assessment tools used by Moroccan or other facilities that use race as one variable to assess the patient's risk to can cancer? Do these tools use local data or do they employ what's being used in the US and Europe? Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, thank you, BT. So I'll, I'll answer based uh, on what I know so far. Um, Morocco doesn't use uh, race as a variable to assess uh, patients' risk of, of cancer. We we don't have the same uh, medical forms that you'd find in the US or, or the UK. Um, however, they do use family history based on a questionnaire that they will give uh, the patient and lifestyle. I think these are the two variables um, among others that I know um, the Moroccan uh, sort of oncologists would use, uh, but there isn't a Moroccan model for cancer diagnosis. Um, I know someone, a very brilliant uh, female engineer who's been working on it, but it's, uh, it's a prototype, it's for her PhD research and nobody's willing to necessarily fund it uh, for it to become a national artifact that would um, benefit women uh, with breast cancer because that's uh, what she works on. Um, so the algorithms do use uh, foreign data um, for cancer diagnosis. Yeah. Hmm. 
Thanks for, for answering that question. Um, and I'm just noting that, Kenley, I know you also have to, to jump off. So thank you so much also for being with us today. Um, and yeah, just uh, wonderful conversations all around. Um, if, if anyone else has questions or comments from the participants, from anyone else in the room. Yes, Jed wanted to say thank you. Thank you very much for our amazing conversation. I like it very much and I hope we can see it online later. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Uh, <laughs> Bye and thank you. Yes, we'll, we'll be sharing this um, recording online, so um, it will be available and in the public record. Um, so yes, if, if no other questions, then yeah, I'd love to hand over to Caitlin to for any just remarks, to, conclusions. Yeah, just to close it off. It's fabulous. It's such an interesting conversation. Such a great group of people that you've curated. Such great questions. Such great point of departure for more conversations, I think. It's just really the beginning of a, of a wonderful um, discussion that we're hoping that we'll continue to have globally um, and to continually expand and deepen and question and be um, critical of our own analysis and also ever exploring better ways for us to have also the conversation, but also the tools. I wanted, there, there's so much that you, everybody said that was, that resonated and I thought was just brilliant and, and, and thought provoking. Um, but I will take this quick opportunity just to say that the Feminist AI Research Network does have this fabulous grant where we are able to subgrant for new models and new ways of looking at AI. Um, there are a lot of people have looked at that as potential policy interventions. Um, I'm very heartened to hear people talk about new economic allocation um, models that might be invented or maybe not even invented, maybe taken from traditional models, but are now able to be algorithmically, mathematically expanded um, with the nuance that we have with really big numbers and, and larger data. So um, we're looking for different ways to do social allocation. We're looking for different ways to think about um, data collaboratives, uh, communitarian principles. How can we take the tools that are being invented with our, the new ideas from, um, the new and old ideas from anthropology, the best of, the new and old and the evolving notion of practice, evolving notion of representation, which seems to be changing as we're all growing together. And, um, and to try and see how we can actually make things that will make a difference in people's lives because we're also the people who are the tool makers as well as the, the tool talkers. And uh, here's a an opportunity that we wanna share with all of you and will continue to share. So I wanna say thank you so much. And um, again, thank you, Ingrid, for being such a great moderator. And thank you, all the speakers are to Peace Oliver from um, Uganda, Amina Soumani from, from Morocco and soon South Africa, and our two other speakers, um, Kenley Camacho from Costa Rica and Sarita Amute from University of Washington and Data and Society. So with that, I think if that's all right, we're gonna say, bid you adieu and uh, we'll see you next time. So thanks, yeah, bye bye. And thank you audience for being here with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. It was great.